Howe, Hughes Audio and Video Entertainment. When you want the best, have the best. Fushal Madeira. Almost before we know it, we have reached Fushal, this charming island paradise, a beauty spot of nature set in a sea of eternal summer. Hardly has the vessel come to anchor in front of Fushal, the principal town of the group of islands, than we are surrounded by a fleet of little boats carrying boys and young men with no article of clothing but a flimsy cloth around their loins. With eager faces they watch for the coins which the passengers on board fling into the water and then plunging in, they follow these until they are secured. Coming up they exhibit their prize and immediately begin pleading for more. In other boats are peddlers who display their wares and who desire to sell you everything from attractively made wicker baskets and chairs to canaries in tiny cages. The island is red in color its hillsides flanked with vineyards, terraces, and dotted with farms and villas. In the foreground lies Fushal, where the houses rise tier above tier and spread out along the bay and back among the foothills. We reach the shore by tender, and on our arrival at the pier, we are amazed at the strange-looking conveyances that are the taxis of Fushal. One never rushes in Fushal, and yielding to the spell of leisure and contentment that pervades the narrow streets and quaint little shops, we explore the town in the popular native conveyance, a low wooden sledge, drawn by bullocks. We have here a typical street of Fushal, with the Pico Fortress in the background. Madeira is a Portuguese possession. It is probable that the island was discovered and forgotten several times before its official discovery in 1420 by Zarco, who found the island uninhabited except by wild goats and pigs, which had probably been placed there by some far-seeing pirates. Columbus is identified with the early history of Madeira. The story goes that he saw a very attractive-looking girl at a school in Portugal. He found that she was a native of Madeira, and a year later he followed her to her island home and married her in 1473. His father-in-law was a mariner, and Columbus got his first taste for a seafaring life by studying his charts and going with him on trading expositions. It was while living in Madeira that Columbus conceived the idea of sailing westward in search of a new route to the Indies, and so chanced to discover the New World. The gallant English explorer Captain Cook visited the island in 1768, and while his ship was in the harbor, the English flag was openly insulted. He immediately opened fire upon the city, and especially against New Rock, which was fortified. The people of the city were the principal sufferers in this brief engagement, and they were glad to make humble submission. On a subsequent visit, he was well received and treated with distinguished honor. In 1801 and again in 1807, Madeira was taken possession by the British, and for a short time the Union Jack waved over the islands. The defeated Napoleon was brought here in 1815 before being conveyed to St. Helena. This is one of the three aqueducts by which the floodwaters after a torrential storm are carried to the sea. Were it not for these aqueducts with their high massive walls, the city would be at the mercy of the raging torrents that rush down the mountain slopes, endangering life and property. It is the celebrated excursion to the top of the mountain that furnishes the chief thrill of the visit at Fushal. 
We climb the mountain by cogwheel railway, and all along the way we are delighted with the glimpse of lovely gardens, orchards, and terraced vineyards. The homes of the natives are anything but pretentious. Many of them are rude hovels, but in the mild and genial climate which prevails here all year round, little is required in the way of shelter. Every hut has its patch of ground which by irrigation and careful cultivation is made to produce everything that is needed in the way of fruits and vegetables. When the Portuguese colonized the Madeira Islands, they introduced vines which thrived wonderfully in the soft, equitable climate and Madeira became a celebrated wine-producing land. This group of islands is the home of the famous Madeira wine, which is made from a mixture of black and white grapes. And what lady visitor to Madeira can ever forget the wonderful creations of dainty and delicate embroideries that are temptingly displayed in the shop windows and bazaars of Fuxal? These creations, for the most part, are made by the natives in their own homes. Unfortunately, these people receive but a mere pittance for their beautiful handiwork. I wonder if these people find a sort of compensation for their hard lot in the natural beauty of their surroundings, for Madeira, no matter when you visit it, is a riot of bloom. Some houses are fairly hidden under the purple bougainvillea which flourishes here in all its glory. Pergolias and festoons of orange trumpet flowers, camellias waxy and white, scarlet poinsettias, deep red hibiscus, roses of all kinds, heliotrope, honeysuckle, fuchsias, they riot everywhere. Geraniums grow to a height of 20 feet in a few months. No wonder Madeira is called the Flower Garden of the Atlantic. This was the residence of the late Emperor Charles of Hungary, who, on losing his throne as an aftermath of the World War, was banished to Madeira, where he lived in exile with his family. He and his charming family were very popular with the people. It was here that he died of pneumonia in March 1922. This Fuchal flower vendor is carried away in snapshot pictures by thousands of visitors every year. I doubt if she ever disposes of any of her flowers, but day after day she poses for innumerable pictures, and if rumor be true, she receives in tips a hundredfold more than she could ever earn as a flower vendor. We have now reached the highest point on the mountain to which the Cog Railway will carry us. There are still four or five hundred yards of climb to the plateau where an excellent lunch at the up-to-date restaurant is awaiting us. Some visitors are too lazy to walk this distance and native carriers who are always on the watch for an opportunity to make a little money are ready to convey them in hammocks to the top. After luncheon, we will stroll around the broad terraces, which claims an altitude of 3,000 feet and commands a magnificent view over a large portion of the island, with its terraced hillsides and quaint little villages, some of them clinging to the hillsides and others nestled in deep ravines. And now comes the greatest thrill of our visit, a toboggan ride of four miles down the mountain in basket sledges. Some of these sledges accommodate two passengers, others three. The two-seated ones are always in demand by couples sentimentally inclined. These people as you see them here look quite composed, but that is because their conveyances have been arrested to give the photographer an opportunity of securing a picture. But the very moment the sledges start careening madly down the pebbled paved incline, the air is rent with the screams and laughter of the now excited voyagers. The wicker sled is shaped like a basket and is guided by two natives who run alongside of it, hanging on to the ropes that serve as a steering gear. Down we go on the twisted corrugated path, careening madly, but in perfect safety to life and limb. On we go between vine festooned walls, past quaint medieval doorways and balconies, beneath arbors covered with grapevines. As we reach the outskirts of the town and glide between the picturesque little white houses of Fuchal, we catch an occasional glimpse of black-eyed senoritas peeping at us from behind a lattice grill or blue Venetian blinds. Altogether, we have a wonderful time as we coast down into Fuchal. I wish we could spend more time in this Isle of Enchantment.
I feel that Madeira, rising in stately majesty out of the tropic iridescent sea and garland with all the bounteous bloom of nature, forms a charming introduction to the Mediterranean.